Zainab, thank you so much for being with me. I'm so grateful. Oh, I am the one who is grateful. It's an honor and an extreme pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. I had the pleasure of being with you on your podcast. Uh, you asked me questions about my life, and I look forward to uh, asking you questions about yours. Um, Women for Women, an organization about which I've known for quite a while, uh, came to my mind uh, recently specifically in relation to what is happening in Afghanistan, because I think of you as someone who can give us some of the deeper story as well as wisdom about that story. So many of us are holding so much pain in our hearts, really. But I want to go back, because I think that your knowledge of Afghanistan stems from your larger knowledge of women uh, living in conflict and war zones, and that begins with your own story. You yourself, growing up, born and raised in Iraq, and knowing as a child none other than Saddam Hussein. So can you give us a little thumbnail sketch about your own um, path, uh, both in Iraq, out of Iraq, ultimately finding your way to the United States and founding Women for Women? Um, yeah, I mean, war has been um, a defining part of the story of my life. I, as you said, I grew up in Baghdad, Iraq, and I grew up uh, during the Iran-Iraq war. And in that time, three things I would say that defined my life or my upbringing. One is war. And as a child, I would notice that the news would only talk about war from men's perspective. And that I was just like a 10 years old kid. But the news were talking about the tanks and the, you know, and the planes and the soldiers and all of that. But me as a child, I knew that the ones who are running the show in my life are all women. My mother, the teachers, the doctors, the police women, everyone was a woman in my life and no one was talking about them in the news. And so there was... A, a major awareness and awakening as a child, which is like, oh, wow, the news talks about war from a man's perspective, but no one is talking about war from a woman's perspective. And women keep life going during war. And their voices of what does that mean for war or what does that mean for peace is essentially important that over time I learned they're not being incorporated. The second impact in my life is that as you mentioned, I grew up with calling Saddam Hussein uncle. Now, he wasn't related to me. My father uh, was his pilot and the head of Iraqi civil aviation, and he chose my family to be his social friends. They were a political family and safe. And, and that was um, a, a nightmare, I would say. I mean, um, being close to the dictator did not mean that we were safer from danger. It meant that we were mm -hmm. closer to danger. It was complicated because here we are closer to the, the, the president. And so we had financial privileges and cars and helicopters and all of these things. But we were in fear. I mean, I grew up with my mom saying, never look at him in the eyes. He knows how to read eyes, to always smile when he smiles, to always cry when he cries. Whatever he says, you say, yes, uncle. And that defined um, that fear. I mean, like when I wrote about it in my memoir, I was like, I couldn't describe fear to Americans. It's like, for me, it's a material thing almost. Um, and how could you describe fear, which was so much part of your DNA and how I grew up? The third part is my mom. Now, it's amazing, Marianne, because here's a woman from Baghdad, Iraq, um, who struggled a lot. You know, I mean, she would, you know, I grew up with my mom trying to commit suicide over and over again. And she would tell me, I cannot prove to the people that we are in prison and that I am living inside the prison, except the cages of the prison are golden, you know, and that's our relationship with Saddam. But my mom also made me read as a child, as a teenager, all kinds of books about women's rights and about women's freedom. And it's about, she made me read about American history of, you know, roots of African-American histories. And she made me read all kinds of stories about marginalized people worldwide. And I, like, she's choosing these books for me and telling me to read it. And she would tell me that I have to be strong and I have to be independent and I should never let any man touch me or talk to me in the wrong way and I should always I should, I should never learn how to cook or clean because no man should expect me to know that just because I'm a woman and so here's this woman I just like you know 
thank God to her because as I'm living in fear, because of the war and because of Saddam, I have this mother who instill, installs strength and the importance of independence and freedom in my, in my DNA. So here I am. Here's how my story really starts. I was 16 years old. My mom was driving. We're in the war. And I turned to her and I was like, Mama, when I grow up, I want to help all women. And, you know, it's like sometimes when we make a difference, it just takes one person to believe in us, just one. And in my case, it was my mom. She turns to me and she said, honey, you can. And the rest was history. I mean, the rest then, obviously, I did not act on it. Um, and three years after that, my mom came and asked me to um, accept a marriage proposal to a guy I did not know in America. I was surprised because he's a very liberal woman and told me that I should make all my choices in life. And, and all of a sudden, she's begging me to accept a marriage from a man I don't know. But I loved her and I trusted her. And she would cry and tell me, I don't care what you do. Just please say yes and go to America. And once you arrive, I don't care what you do there. And, you know, I had, you know, dated a guy and it was drama before and all of that. And I was rebelling and all of these things. So I wanted to be a good girl. And I listened to my mom and I accepted this marriage proposal. And this is how I came to America in an, in an arranged marriage, which I did ex agree to, to make my mom um, stop crying. And I enter the mar I get into the marriage in June 1990. Um, my parents, we have the wedding here. My parents leave. Within a month, Iraq invades Kuwait. And I see myself stuck in America. And I say stuck, not in America, in an abusive marriage uh, who does, who, uh, where the husband does everything to me that my mom told me never to accept. I had no vocabulary for the meaning of rape at that time. I really didn't know that. I knew sex is something to be enjoyed and to be celebrated. I knew that I should not let anybody, anybody touch me the wrong way. But that man raped me. And he was my husband. And I had no family around me. They went to Iraq. And their borders are closed and sanctions. And I couldn't even pick up the phone and say, what have you done? But I knew that was wrong. And so I endured three months of it. And after three months, I escape from him. I leave with a suitcase full of nice clothes, you know, <laughs> but $400 in my pockets. And I vow that I shall make something out of my life and that one day I shall uh, implement my dream of helping women around the world. Uh, and I will do that even for the women back home. But now I have to build my life. And that's how my story started in America, really. The second chapter of my life with $400 um, in Chicago. And, and now, and then a few years later, a couple of years later, actually, I started Women for Women International. Okay, now I want to go back a little bit because I think some people might say, wow, her mother was so cool, was so enlightened, was so progressive. Why would she have sent you away? But I've heard you say... Uh, in other interviews, that your mother, being the savvy woman that she was, could help but n couldn't help but notice that Saddam Hussein looked a little infatuated by you, this pretty teenage girl. Mm -hmm. She was afraid that Saddam Hussein would rape you. You came later to suspect that he had raped her. So I think that that's an important part of the story. The reason she was crying and saying, go to America, go to America, because she feared for your life uh, and for your well-being should you stay there. The other question, but a question I have for you, when your parents, given the fact that they lived in such risk and danger as part of Saddam Hussein's inner circle, when they came to the United States, first of all, I'm a little curious, so you, it was easy enough for you to come to the United States? Well, my father was a commercial pilot, right. so I actually so he could arrange for that. Coming. No, yeah. and I also came to Seattle all my childhood because we would buy okay. Iraqi, we would buy a new planes and Boeing, oh, okay. and so that's, okay. yes, yeah. So... Given their situation in Iraq, they came over here for your wedding. Did do you think, you might not even know, do you think that they considered staying here and seeking asylum? Oh, that was the fight of my uh, life, my, my family. There's always tension. I and mean, here we are in war, and then we knew Saddam, and our house was bugged. 
the fight between my parents all my life was my mom begging my father to escape and my father saying, I can't escape. If I do, he will kill the rest of the family. And that's why, I mean, here's the thing. You see, with fear, I mean, even me as a child, right? Is I wasn't oblivious to the injustice that was happening in front of me because I would go to school and there are girls talking about public execution in the neighborhoods, you know? There, I, I knew that this is happening. There were girls talk about their families. They're, the father's coming and chopped up pieces because he said something wrong or they're in prison or my best friend in elementary school her father was you know suddenly I'm told I cannot see her because her father went to prison for being a political opposition the thing is w the punishment wasn't of the person the punishment was of the extended family so it's your brothers and your sisters and your uh, all of these things and so that's how he kept everyone in fear constantly because we never know who is going to be punished and who's not and that's and that's why the, the struggle between my parents my mom saying leave and my father says i can't pay the price of of having the rest of the family struggle so your parents went back there are they still in iraq or did you parents... it was a very sad story first of all thank you for mentioning why my mom did what she did i always forget to skip I skip it because the the narrative is I arrive and I felt betrayed by my mother <coughs> the woman I love the most she I was like how does she why does she do that to me leave me in, in a strange country alone and I was really angry at her for nine years I mean I at that time I had already studied women for women I was already working with women but I was very angry at my mother and for nine years I did not see my family I couldn't there was embargo and sanctions against Iraq I could only hear their voice for two minutes every week my mom would line up just to hear just to call me it's like how are you doing all of that and these phones were bugged for two minutes we were allowed only by Iraqi side and then finally she escapes actually at one point she escapes from Iraq Saddam um, gets very angry at her, calls her a traitor for escaping from Iraq. Um, she escaped because he had, Saddam notoriously was known for raping um, as many women as he liked. Um, even if you're close to him, it didn't matter. And if not his uh, sons, and if it's not his brothers, and you know, it's like uh, it, it, he was notorious for that. So she escaped from that and he was angry and he cut off the family from the relationship. So nine years later, my mom comes here for treatment and she dies, unfortunately, from Lou Gehrig's disease. And I go to bury her in Iraq and it was the first time I see my entire family and here's the last thing i want to say about that because when she's dying and it's a very you know luke eric's is a very uh, tough disease and she lost her voice and six months before she's dying we are healing and we know she's dying and i ask her for what happened because i'm taking care of my mom but i'm still hurt and she writes me her story and she tells me the full truth and that was the best gift my mother gave me is the truth. I mean, I always say my mom gave me the best gift of her life through her death because I was able to get her truth and I was able to get my truth and I was able and and, and truth she thought she was us. saving you. Yes, she did. She, she was Perhaps like the Vietnamese mothers you. who were like sending their babies out, like just get out, just get out. And she would tell me all these stories that I remember. It's just I was not conscious. He was uncle. I was not conscious that he could actually do that to me. But as an adult woman, oh, my God, these were real stories. And if that happened to my child, I would be scared, too. Um, so it's... Um, and uh, she, you know, it's, it's this all healing. She, she passed away uh, many years ago and my father is now um, in Jordan and my entire family, Marianne. I grew up, as, you, as I mentioned, and, you know, being close to him, we were in a very affluent uh, society. Everyone right now is a refugee. Every, my entire family, except for an uncle and an aunt, are all refugees around the world as a result of the second Gulf War that really displays um, a lot of uh, everyone in my memory, everyone, and destroyed everything in my childhood, uh, everything, including the house I grew up with. Well, of course, all the terrible experiences that you had and that you witnessed, I'm sure, formed 
the huge compassionate global heart, particularly for the plight of women, that fueled the founding of Women for Women and has continued uh, to, to fuel it and to make it what it is today. So we look back at certain experiences that we've been through and we recognize their significance in ways that we would not have known at the time. You started Women for Women, and I want every woman who is, or man also, uh, who is watching right now to understand that you too can participate. Uh, when we talk about that, over it's over a hundred million dollars. How how much? One hundred and forty-six million dollars, actually. One hundred and forty-six yes. million dollars that has gone to women around the world uh, who are survivors of some of the most horrific kinds of experiences, the kinds of things that Zainab has talked about <clears throat> in her own past. Uh, surviving sometimes, to be honest, even worse things than she described. Mm -hmm. And for, what is it, $30 a month? So here's the story of Women for Women, because it's like I learn about wars, and I come to America, and, you know, there's freedom of expression in America, which I did not grow up with this. And and I, I've been in this country for 31 years, I mean, more than I've been in my home country, Iraq, right? And I'm, until today, look at me, I'm like, I get excited when I, when I think about the freedom of expression in America. Like, I can say anything and I don't get killed for it, or at least most people don't get killed for it. I mean, some people do. You we know, know of. <laughs> exactly. <Not yet>. <laughs> um, but I hear I you, though. Like, uh, but I was like, wow, I can say anything. And so when I come here, two years after I come here, I learn of another war in Bosnia, a country I don't know anything about, like I, Yugoslavia, I don't know anything about. But I knew, that I was reading in the news that there was there were rape camps uh, that where women are being put in, there are concentration camps, women were giving numbers, they were, when their numbers were called, they would go to the other room and gang raped, and it was all over the news. And here's where, the, where, where, my, where my past gets uh, like a clicked basically because it's like I knew injustice in Iraq but I couldn't do anything about it because we had fear I was living in fear but now I'm in a country that gives me the freedom of expression and I have to as a human I really I mean it was I I worked in countries that I have no affiliation with whatsoever not culturally not not religiously nothing but I was like I I have a duty and responsibility as a human to take advantage of this freedom that this country gives me and do something about it. And so I was only 23 years old kid at that time, you know, only in America three years, you know, max. And I was like, we have to do something. And all my friends were like making fun of me. I had obviously gotten divorced, but had fallen in love and married someone, a, a wonderful man who helped me co-found Women for Women International. And everyone was like, get a job, get a car, buy a house. What are you bothering with these women you don't know anything about? But I was like, no, we must do something. And it started with this simple request that you just mentioned. Every woman, please sponsor one woman at a time by sending her $30 a month in war zone, in conflict areas, exchange letters and pictures with her. Let her know you're not alone. Let her know you see her and you recognize her. And that cash gives her a break, you know, a breathing room to spend whatever she wants to spend on, to save some of it. And we will help her get jobs, get uh, get uh, technical skills to get jobs, learn, teach her about her rights in society, in politics, in economy, and then helps her stand on her feet. Now, it was because I didn't have any money. You know, I, I didn't have any family with me even. And I was like newly went to this wonderful guy, but we were one, both students. This $30 a month started with 30 women that I personally distributed the funds to in 1993. And as we speak now, how many? More than f nearly half a million women were sponsored through this program. $146 million were raised by individual women who each sponsor one woman at a time. It's a, for me, I mean, this obviously changed my life. If it wasn't for the women I worked with, I wouldn't even dare would, would not have dared to tell my story because I was so afraid of telling my story. 
But the what it helped me learn is the power of change and the power of individuals. And philanthropy is not an access to those who have a lot of money. Philanthropy is an access to each one of us. Those who we do, I mean, like the bank clerk is a philanthropist. The park ranger is a philanthropist. You don't have to have wealth to be a philanthropist. It's just we give each from what we can. And and the giving is not only with the money, it's of our stories. And that's why I like the letters and the pictures. It's because we're because in our stories, we're equal as humans. In our financial resources, we are not. But in our emotions and our witnessing of each other, that's the equality between each other. And that's how Women for Women started. A couple of things. First of all, what is the website that people can go to right now if they want to give to Women for Women? It's simply womenforwomen.org. Womenforwomen.org. You know, early in my career, um, when I was just, I was still a temporary secretary and I was giving lectures and my mother came to my house uh, one day and she saw all of these envelopes um, on my bed. And she said, what are they? And I said, well, I'm deciding where to give my money this month. And she laughed at me. She said, what money? And I explained to her that I was giving $18 to, um, uh, to Danny Thomas to heal childhood leukemia. And I was giving $10 to something else, et cetera. And my mother used to laugh and say I was the only poor philanthropist she had ever met. But I had learned that I wasn't waiting till I had money to give. I mean, it's even a metaphysical principle. You, you attract what you give, but I, I knew that I, you know, I, I meet people like that. Once I make a lot of money, I'm going to give money. Um, and the philanthropist's heart has nothing to do with how much money you have. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this I is so definitely. beautiful. I mean, I have, I remember a moment where Angelina Jolie announced sponsoring, I don't know, many women, let's say a hundred women, I think. And it was a big announcement and it's Angelina Jolie and we're all excited. And I go after the announcement to the bathroom and the woman who's distributing the tissues at the bathroom, she recognized me and she says, oh, you are with Women for Women. I'm a sponsor. And can mm-hmm. I tell you, I mean, I am more proud that that woman is a sponsor. You know, yeah. Angelina Jolie, and I love Angelina, you know, like giving that 100 women is one thing, but that woman is a sponsor and equal to Angelina Jolie and equal to everyone. That's my, like the pride is like, wow, we all are equal. You know, it's, in our it, giving. It's also putting something sacred into the purpose behind money. I remember when I ran for office reading a woman who had donated $10. She said, here's $10. And when I get paid again, I'm going to send another $10. Oh, beautiful. How much that meant to me. How beautiful. much that meant to me. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. So tell me some of the countries that are involved and how long ago did Women for Women begin to be involved with women in Afghanistan? So started with Bosnia and then I followed every war, you know, and the war after that was Rwanda and the war after that was Kosovo and the war after that was Southern Sudan and then yeah, Nigeria. And then like you just, you kept, you kept every war I became like a, a I get maybe I had an Joan of Arc's uh, symptoms, you know, it's like war happened, our sisters are there and we would go. And Afghanistan, we started working in, like around 2001 on the borders at the with with the refugees in Pakistan and then the minute uh, this is around September 11 and then the minute um after uh, September 11 when the American troops went we and the refugees started coming back to Afghanistan I believe that was early 2002 and that's when we both uh, we women for women went with the refugees and entered Afghanistan and opened our offices there and I was you know usually my my role um as the CEO was like to, I, and this was my passion also. It is my passion to like go in the midst of it and set up the office and go to the, you know, find the women and find the staff and all of these things. And I remember a story because in this moment, um, the stories are all coming back. But the first time I went, there was a girl and a child, you know, and they were like, and I, we opened a woman's office. We had, um, it's a women's center and we had, you know, as far as your eyes can see, women with burqas, with the blue burqas, I used to wear the early days, right? A sea of them lining up and waiting to enter, to register their names and to get into the program. And there was a child, I noticed a child. So I go to the child and I said, are you here with your parents, with your mom? And she's like, no, I don't have a mom. I was like, 
you know, do you have a parents? Like, no, I'm an orphan. Well, okay, honey, but this is for an adult uh, organization for adult women. Maybe I should take you for a, a children's organization. It's like, no. And it's like, how about if I give you some money? No, I want to register in the program. I give you some candy. No, I want to register them somewhere, you know. And I was like, what are your name? What is your name? And her name is Zainab, same as my name. And, you know, I'm like thinking, two Zainabs, you know. I've got, you know, here. But I grew up privileged and she grew up an orphan. I am educated and he, she is in that line, you know, uh, waiting to get any aid. And it doesn't matter for her if it's a, adults or groups. And, of course, I feel um, I couldn't, I connect with her, obviously, because our name is common. Anyway, I follow the story, and it's a long story, you know, and, and it's a very long story, but now she is married, and she's educated, and she went to college, and she has two kids, and she's doing well, and she texts me two days ago. You know, actually, no, I apologize. She texts me right after uh, uh, Taliban takes over Kabul, and she says, please help me get out. We are scared. We are scared. And so for me to witness the, you know, sort of the the blossoming the blossoming of women and like you know taking on the role and 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 going and becoming judges and ministers and politicians and journalists and you know poetess and all of that and thriving and you know singing and then and then we leave them abandoned and crying. And I have like texts from staff, right, left, and center, saying we have never cried as much as we are crying the last two weeks in here. Did she get out, do you know? No, she couldn't get out. You know, I've been part of an effort. Um, when I heard, I got a call the week, the day before um, the Taliban took over Kabul. And I get a call from someone, a colleague I sit with in about another board, and he says, Zainab, the Taliban have been killing, have been assassinating women steadily in the last year, women leaders. And now we have captured a list, what's called a kill list, that the Taliban have put together of the most prominent women to kill them, and we need to get them out. And these women, may I say, were not in any priority of the U.S. government. I was, I, I don't know what's the expression, I, I'm angry. I'm angry because there's all these speeches about women's rights and we believe in women and all of that. When 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 it's in this critical moment, these women leaders were not in the priority of the U.S. government to to be evacuated, and it was literally a co like a, a, an organic way of women calling each other in our network. Some of us, we know each other. Some of us, we don't know each other. Some of us were rivalries or like, you know, competitors which we call and we like, this is a crisis. This, there's no plan to evacuate these women. And Lord and behold, I mean, we raised between, and it was by the way, distributed to different organizations. Depends on the roles each organization are doing, Women for Women in This, Vital Voices Here, uh, V Day is Here, like different ones, and raise about $10 million all together to basically do everything we can to evacuate some of these women, to help them resettle, to have a plan for the women in Afghanistan. But And, and we succeeded some, and we did not succeed in some, as we are talking now. Um, and but the and, and it's like so making Sophie's choice every day, which woman you evacuate and which woman you cannot have, basically. And we focus on the ones who we know that their lives will be at highest risk, basically. And it was a testament of sisterhood beyond any borders, any nationalities or organization or government or anything like that. It was a testament of the power of women. It is the testament of strength and loyalty for women. And it was also, also a testament, honestly, that all these talks about women's rights, all these speeches, you know, people give about women's rights, when, forgive the expression, but when shit hit the fan, they were not there. We had, we women had to fight for our sisters to get out. The men did not prioritize it. Not all, but the men did not prioritize it. Um, and, and, and they would have abandoned them completely. You are a very powerful and influential woman. I assume you had some friends 
with, at least with contacts, the State Department, Secretary Blinken, et cetera. Did you have contact with anyone? Uh, were you able to get through to anyone? Was there anyone pleading the case uh, for prioritizing the women who had been most prominent uh, and um, American uh, help for these women? Well, wasn't only me. I'm part of, again, I met a lot of groups of women where we all call each other five, six, seven, ten times a day, 24 hours uh, in the middle of the night. We made every call possible to every government possible, honestly, to every government possible. And we had to fight for the women. And, and it was a lot of women inside the government who helped us, not only the U.S. government, but other governments in Europe helped us and in the Middle East helped us. It was women who helped us. But when it came to the men, we would like give them a list of, let's say, please help these hundred women, and they would choose two women. You know, and we, we would like li literally elbow us, you know, in the airports, in the, all of these things that as we get our women out, basically. So, yeah, I can't. Uh, uh, and there were obviously men who showed up and helped a lot, you know, but I'm talking about formally from from the governments. No, we were not the priority, even though every call was made. It was women in the government who showed up in all governments, but not necessarily the men. It seems to me that there are so many people who in their understandable um, happiness that the war is over, really underestimated the um, significance of the fact that this evacuation was not done in a better way. Um, I assume from what you've said that it is your opinion that this evacuation could have been done much differently and um, could have begun much earlier and could have been far more strategic, correct? Well, I uh, most definitely. I mean, Iraq, uh, America, uh, when it evacuated from Iraq, there was much more official handover to the government of Iraq. Mind you, ISIS took over uh, a year later and, and we were all petrified by ISIS uh, the whole world was petrified for ISIS for three years, but at least there was a much more official transition and a, and a handover. In this case, it was unnecessarily chaotic. It didn't have to be. No one here wants America to stay in Afghanistan. It's okay to, to withdraw. It's okay to, to end the occupation, but do it responsibly. We entered that country. We entered Iraq, my home country. We entered Afghanistan by American wish and will. And we exit with responsibility. And as I reflect on this moment in history, you know, it's 20 years after September 11. And at the end of the day, I feel America had lost so much more than just simply handing over Afghanistan back to the Taliban unintentionally, but that the Taliban takes over within weeks. It, it lost its moral ground that the world really did respect and the world really believed in. And so many, many warriors around the world who risked their lives for fighting for, Ameri for, for Western values of freedom and women's rights and ex freedom of expression, all of that. And they, they were American values and they were sold for this world. And America as a reliable country, as the country that everyone looks up to, respect, America, 20 years later, lost that. Absolutely. Lost that. There, was no, there was no moral compass there. And for the most part, we did not exhibit the highest American values, the ideals of our own country and our own democracy there. And um, there were some examples, such as the women that were helped and the women who did have rights. There were, although Sarah Chase would argue that that was mainly in the big cities, not necessarily in some of the other areas of the country where warlords still were in charge and women were, didn't have uh, any rights that much more than they had had under the Taliban. But um, I think part of the, the horror of what is going on now is people realizing that while there, it's, I, it, it seems to me, Zainab, that the, the, you know, the president is bragging, you know, we got 100,000 people out, but you and I both know that it should have been far more people and it should have been um, far more strategized and executed in a very different way. And 
it seems to me that the basic disregard for humanitarian values with which we exited is exactly the disregard for humanitarian values that we display for the last 20 years. Absolutely. It is a horror. And I hope Absolutely. that we are learning something. And that's really why I want to have these conversations. We must not let this um, just fade away. You know, the, the press will stop talking about it. And it will become like Vietnam, just a pause until we do something horrible like that one more time. Let me ask you about the women that you were not able to get out um, that are still there. You said that the Taliban has a kill list. Are you in still able to communicate with many of these women? Mm. Yes, we are. Um, I mean, that's why I've been spending a lot of my nights on communicating. I mean, and some of them, I mean, these are educated women these are women leaders and to see the vulnerability you know where where like i have goosebumps just thinking about it like you know where women's like please don't leave me alone please don't leave me you know and we're texting and we're talking on whatsapp or signal whatever and like you're seeing the vulnerability and the fear of these women who are respected leaders not begging but like afraid and rightly so afraid for their lives so we don't know what's going to happen now i mean those who left left those, but there's a lot, a lot still in, and we don't believe, no one should believe that Taliban says, oh, we will let people in and we will let women work and all of these things. I've worked in all my work experience in war zones. I have lost, I can't tell you how many friends, female friends, leaders in Benghazi, Libya, in Yemen, in Syria, in Iraq, in so many countries that they do get assassinated because Women's voices are seen as threatening to, by fundamentalists, basically. They question the very existence of fundamentalist beliefs and values. So I have no doubt, no doubt that they will continue, not start, continue their assassinations one by one of the women leaders and men lead intellectuals as well. And so we, are, we honestly are now looking and scrambling for plan B and C and D to see what we can do to keep our uh, our movement of keeping the women um, out. But honestly, I, I can tell you about myself, but I know a lot of women, we will not forget this one. And no. we will not forget their voices and we will not betray them. And I will, you know, I will live to the last breath of my life and we will keep on shouting until their voices are heard and until they are safe and protected. Because it's one thing for the country to betray them and to turn around, but now it's up to us individual private citizens who will say we will not let this go until women in Afghanistan are safe. And I don't know how we're going to do it, but we shall not forget and we will not be silent. Well, I know I, for one, and I'm sure many people who will be listening to this podcast will do anything possible and look to you and look for, to women for women for direction and how we can in any way be uh, helpful to that effort. Um, even before 9-11, I was very aware of the issue of Afghanistan women, women in Afghanistan and the Taliban. This was already a conversation people were having. And to know that not only we're back sort of where we were before, but also the role that the United States played in giving a glimmer of hope and then um, where we are now. I have such admiration for you. And we are also lucky for your leadership, fortunate for your leadership. Not only are the women in these war zones fortunate to have your leadership and your aid um, and your inspiration, but those of us here and in Western democracies or any democracies who just want to help but feel so hopeless. So please know any time, it could be an Instagram Live, it could be something on, just if there's any way, Marianne, I want to talk to people. Um, People need to know this. They could help this way. Please, uh, I'm just one small platform out of many, but please uh, take advantage in any way and please let me know. And like I said, women will be going, and I'm sure men too, uh, to womenforwomen.org. Um, I, I hope that everybody uh, listening will. And um, please keep this torch alive and tell us how we can help. Thank you, thank you so much. You know, I wish, I mean, I'm tearing up because first of all, thank you so much. And the thing is, I wish it's enough, you know, for every woman we 
be there for her. We're there for her. They are like a thousands that we don't reach. And it's just, it's a uh, thank you. And it's not enough for me. Like, you know, it's like, uh, it's like the, I have to focus on like, not to torture <laughs> myself that it's not enough what we're doing and yet we're doing everything is possible but everyone need to show up in this moment and you know what i'm asking of all americans because because as you said we need to reflect on this moment we can let it go and 20 years later we invade another country and we do that and we don't learn from the mistakes and how do we engage with other countries how do we engage i used to testify in the senate foreign relations committee and here's the my biggest lessons of this war many of one of men one, one of many is that we went about it from kill as many taliban as possible and if you kill them we'll be okay as opposed to the more we kill the more people, the more Taliban's will, will rise up, their sons and their grandsons and all of that. And instead we need to, and this is, we go back to my first point when I was a child in Iraq. When women are involved in defining war and peace, it's different. It's about, the, the peace becomes not about killing as many of your enemy as possible. It is about how do you make people's lives better? How do you get them more schools and more jobs and paint the roads and pave the roads and if you do that they will actually love you and pray with for you and like that's how you get their hearts and minds not by killing them and well, we that's, missed that point we missed well that that's point. what i've been talking about and writing about we waged war but we did not wage peace absolutely and that's because we don't even have a context a conceptualization of what it means to wage peace uh, we were supporting a very corrupt government um in in afghanistan that the people didn't like a whole lot uh, better than they liked the taliban we were preparing an army in our image rather than armed forces that truly were an organic expression of the kind of guerrilla warfare that Af <laughs> afghanis have known how to do for thousands of years guys uh, it's it's uh, it's it's such a bankrupt model uh, by which we think that if you just apply more brute force, that's going to fix it. Women have a different perspective and views. Uh, they're looking at things from a different narrative of their children and our narratives and peace and stabilities. And until our full inclusion is happening, you know, no, we I mean, we may we're making progress. But it's not, we are, we're not done yet. We're, but well, if this is a mountain, we're halfway in the mountain, let's say. We're not up the mountain yet. But I do believe the 21st century shall become the feminine century. And I call it feminine because for me, it's not about women only. It's about feminine values that we do need to bring up to the world. And I believe that this century will become the feminine century because if we don't make it that, and that's why my ask for women is not to only rise in anger and rage, and I am angry right now at what's happening to, uh, to my Afghan sisters, but also rise with our values of love and compassion and kindness and define new values for the century that is coming from our hearts rather than only from our anger and our minds, basically. And so that's, it's, there's a lot more work to be done before we reach the top of the mountain. If we do not move in a more compassionate, nurturing, reverent direction, we won't make it. Absolutely. I mean, the week before the Afghanistan horror, uh, there was the UN climate report. Mm -hmm. I, we, we are seeing the utter bankruptcy of the entire paradigm of military, economic, and political leadership and where it has taken us to. And the feminine, as you say, must take the lead now. Absolutely must take the lead. This is way beyond, well, can we increase the percentages of representation? Because as we know, some women have very patriarchal views of the world, economically mm -hmm. and militarily. Absolutely. But the feminine values and for us to stand for them so unapologetically, that's why we need people like you because you're a role model. You're saying we can stand in the world and stand for these values and not shut, shut up and not apologize for it, especially at a time like this when I think more and more people realize it's literally the the only survivable option for the human race.
Well, you know, thank you. I mean, and and people like you who are showing us actually the feminine values. Thank and you. I learned it the hard way. I mean, you're ahead of the game and you're ahead of everyone actually in terms of showing these feminine values from our hearts. I learned it the hard way because I led with anger for the longest time. I mean, when I was 29 years old and Woman for Woman was already, um, you know, rising star in the group, in the in the world. And someone asked me and they said, what are your, you know, what keeps you going? And I was like, I'm pissed off at injustice. And Marianne, it was actually in Afghanistan that everything changed in my life because I was one time in a refugee camp and two men came towards me and they looked like Taliban. As far as I was concerned, they had beer, their turbans and their clothes and I'm scared, you know, I, you know, just because one works in war zone doesn't mean I'm not scared at times, you know, I was scared in that moment. I was like, oh my God, these guys are going to come and kill me. And I tell my colleague, I was like, let us walk slowly to the car and run out because these are, you know, we're here to be, they're here to be killing us. And she squeezed my arms and hands and she's like, just, you have to wait because if we run, uh, run away, they will suspect that the woman that we just talked with and they may hurt them. So they're walking these guys towards me and my heart is pounding and I'm scared. And then they spread their arms and they come close to me and they shake my hands and I'm shocking shocked and they say we want to thank you for helping our wives smiles smile we have never seen them as happy as we have when you, since you started working with them and i am smiling in front of them and obviously being polite but honestly in my heart i was ashamed of myself because in that moment i realized yes i did lead with anger and i did a lot with anger but that i was risking becoming what i was fighting against that I, here I am fighting against the stereotyping of women and women victimhood and, you know, trying to make sure women have rights and all that. But I was stereotyping these two guys and I thought that they are the Taliban. They are bad just because they're men and they're wearing this clothes, right? And so what makes me a difference than, than anybody who's stereotyping the other or anybody who's stereotyping women or other cultures? And I was so ashamed of myself and it took me to our journey of discovery, I would say. It, it, it was one of the beginning of my inner journey, of my in spiritual journeys of like saying, oh my God, that anger doesn't work to, like I can become what I'm fighting against. And I started really talking with different men in wars. And, you know, and this is in war, so I'm talking about, you know, scary guys, militias and all of that, but all kinds of other people. And I learned that they're the good man and they're the bad man and they're the ugly man and that they're the good woman and that the bad woman and that the ugly woman in terms of our behavior and that actually what we need to to look into is in and and your books i must say and your teachings helped me personally a lot because it's about how do we find our own inner voice and how do we find our own heart's language and how do we fight for injustice but when we fight it with anger, we scare people around. You know, I mean, there are moments of anger. I'm not shy of that. But they're also, how do we go about injustice with love and with kindness so as not to become what we are fighting against? And that's when I talk about the, the shift that we want is not, you know, in my last book, um, it was a sort of activism and, and my spiritual journey. Freedom is an inside job. It's like, it, my activism used to be from the broadness of my chest, like, ah, and I, the more I reflected on myself and to, to try to align my values, not only with what I'm saying, but truly trying to implement every single value in my heart, activism became from the length of my spine. And it's because when we try to implement every value we have in our lives, it's we realize it's actually very hard. It is. It takes a lot of discipline. And in the hardness of it, it made me more compassionate to the people that I am advocating against or for or whatever it is. It just made me more compassionate towards the other. And so when we talk about the feminine century, which is an access to each one of us, as I love how you shaped it. It's not about women rising into leadership. It's about women rising in our feminine voice and men rising in their feminine voice. And, so, and what's at stake is our humanity. It really is as thick our is our humanity, and so I hope that we can. I I learned it the hard way. You are ahead of you were ahead of me for sure, but I think many others. But we have to like this is the moment, and if we don't take. 
this moment seriously, I don't know what would be a wake up call for all of us. Well, I've certainly had my moments as an angry uh, left wing activist. And I talked, I think, in my book, A Return to Love, where I realized I was an angry peace activist. Mm. And Beautiful. and that's when uh, reading Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King meant so much to me, because the basic tenets of nonviolence is that the end is inherent in the means. You can't bring peace to the world if you're not on a search for peace within yourself. Yeah. And I want to mention uh, the titles of your books. Uh, Freedom is an inside job, owning our darkness and our light to heal ourselves and the world. Between Two Worlds, Escape from Tyranny, Growing Up in the Shadow of Saddam, and if you knew me, you would care. And that's what you do for all of us. You give us a window into these women's lives. And once we have that window, once we see through it, we can't help but care. So true. It's so Thank true because you. we will know that our humanity is the same. The cultures, the language, as Rumi says, even the phrase in each other no longer makes any sense when we are um, in the language of the heart, and and I, you know, uh, you know, and so if we know each other, we would care a lot more. And something else you said earlier that I was so grateful to hear you say is that you celebrate the freedoms that we do have here in the United States. Oh. I think, you know, it's so important while we're looking at these shadows that we must look at in this country. It's also so important that we remember what the ideals are and celebrate what we do have. And I, I've said to women for so many years, every time you do something, do it on behalf of women around the world who can't speak for themselves, who can't do the kind of things that you want to do, because if they did, they would be punished or even killed. So don't do it just for yourself. Don't do it just for your country. Do it with these women in mind. It's so true. I mean, I have to tell you, I mean, I truly do. I know this country has a lot of issues with a lot of turmoils, but there's certain fundamental values that are so unique to America. And that is not only the freedom of expression, that is also the generosity. That's so unique to Americans. The generosity of spirit, the generosity and kindness. There's beautiful, I mean, I, as an immigrant, you know, there's a lot of attacks on immigrants these days, but I can tell you as an immigrant, I so appreciate the beauty this country uh, provides. And for me, the fight for these values are so fundamentally important, not only for Americans, not only and every American, but also for the world. What you know, these are good values. We cannot compromise them. We can let them let them wash because our personal interest or national interest is not convenient to fight for these values right now. These are good values. It's it, it's about the goodness of humanity, and we we all have to fight to maintain it uh, and keep it up front and center. Because it is uniquely American. And every generation, you know, in the Jewish religion, it says every generation must rediscover God for itself. Oh. Every I know, isn't that great? So every generation beautiful. of Americans has to rediscover and re-embody exceptional values. Can't be just bequeathed. And you don't have them just because you say you have them. And also, as far as immigrants are concerned, and all four of my grandparents were immigrants, immigrants traditionally are the ones who keep these values alive most passionately because they they appreciate them the most. That's so true because we know what's not. You know yeah. what we don't have, yeah. you know. If, if people act like, you know, we're you know, we're such a gift to them, they're such a gift to us. And that has always been true. And you're such an example. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm grateful. Really. I think the world of you. I know everybody does now. Uh, many people know who you are and know your work, but uh, I think a few more know you. Uh, from this podcast and are now as big of fans as I am. All Thank my you. love to you. Thank you oh, so much. All my love to you. I'm grateful. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.